I've moved out, so your house is gone. It must be tough without a place to call home. But hang in there, my mother-in-law cheerfully announced over the phone. I responded with a disinterested, Hmm, enjoy your life in your new home, she continued. Yes, thank you, and please never come back to my house. After all, you'll be getting a divorce. With that, my mother-in-law hung up. I stood still at the airport for a moment. What welled up within me wasn't anger, but joy. Yes! I clenched my fist in a small victory gesture and set off for home with a spring in my step. My name is Emma. My husband, David, was assigned to work abroad immediately after our marriage, forcing us into a short period of living apart. Despite the distance following our immediate marriage, David and I had been dating for five years before tying the knot and had also lived together. Our long-term relationship and cohabitation had built a strong bond of trust between us. I didn't worry about David being unfaithful, and instead, I hoped that he would remain healthy while overseas. Our days should have continued in this calm, yet sometimes lonely state. But the problem arose when my mother-in-law decided to move into our house. My mother-in-law, married since David was a child, is now single. Upon learning that David was being assigned overseas, she declared, I'll keep my eye on you, Emma, to make sure you don't cheat. She began living in our house without our consent. Apparently, she was cheated on and subsequently abandoned by my father-in-law, whose whereabouts are unknown. To prevent David from experiencing the same thing, she decided to monitor me, but the constant surveillance made life unbearable. Desperate, I turned to David for help. He repeatedly urged his mother to leave, but she refused to listen. David trusts you too much, Emma. I can tell. A woman like you will definitely cheat. She accused baselessly, giving me a headache every day. Regardless of what I did, she linked it to infidelity. My mother-in-law wouldn't even prepare dinner for me. She would cook for herself using food from the fridge, but never left any for me. Moreover, she didn't go grocery shopping herself. She used the ingredients that I had bought for my cooking, leaving me at a loss when I came home and found that the groceries I thought were in the fridge were gone. Of course, I complained about this, but my mother-in-law either didn't care or didn't listen. I suppose you ate dinner out with your boyfriend since you're cheating, she would say, irritating me beyond belief. Even when I came home late from work and started cooking, she would create a commotion accusing, you must be cheating if you come home at this hour, leaving your mother-in-law alone. During my work's busy period, when I was often coming home late, she constantly made a fuss about me cheating. I was so stressed that I even felt sick. I'm begging you, please leave. I'm not cheating. I truly love David. I told her, David, too busy to come back to the U.S., tried his best to persuade his mother. Still, her response was disheartening. So you want me to leave that badly? You must be cheating after all. I could only sigh at this point. <sighs> On a day off, I went out to meet a friend and was once again accused of cheating by my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law seemed determined to catch my infidelity and began a clumsy attempt to tail me from behind. She hid behind lampposts and behind our home's brick wall. Busily skulking about, I chose to ignore her antics. I met up with a friend at a cafe, grumbling in a low voice so my mother-in-law wouldn't hear. Suddenly, a flash of light blinked a few times. It was her, taking pictures of me. My friend, looking suspicious, asked, What's that, a stalker? My friend Abby has been a close friend since our student days. Abby, a tough woman, began to stand up saying, Should I tell her off? but I quickly persuaded her to sit. No, no, please sit down. Abby, sporting a pixie cut in street-style fashion, looked androgynous. I mentioned that my mother-in-law might have mistaken her for a man, which caused Abby to double over in laughter. Enjoying the spectacle, Abby leaned closer to me, held my hand as a joke to provoke my mother-in-law. Each time, my mother-in-law flashed her camera, capturing every moment. When I checked in the mirror, she seemed thrilled, snapping photos of us while her nostrils flared with excitement. I found myself laughing at the absurdity of the situation. <laughs>
Having witnessed my mother-in-law's silly antics, I managed to let off some steam and went on to do a little shopping with Abby before we parted ways. Sure enough, my mother-in-law followed me home, hiding behind lampposts and brick walls just like before. Every so often, I'd quickly run around like playing a game of red light, green light, and she'd scamper off to hide. It was amusing, and I found myself playing along with her ridiculous game. I thought how foolish she must be to believe that I didn't notice her tailing me. Once I arrived home and started to take off my shoes, my mother-in-law quickly rushed in. If she was tailing me, she could have at least delayed her return home. I was taken aback when she excitedly showed me a disposable camera. Emma, I finally got proof of your infidelity. I'm going to send all of these to David, so be prepared. Oh, really? Good luck with that. She didn't like my nonchalant response and spent the rest of the time buzzing around me like a nagging child. Are you okay with this? It's proof of infidelity. Your face and his are both clear in the photos. But I calmly kept responding. That's fine. While it was unfortunate that Abby's androgynous look got her mistaken for a man, David had met Abby several times before we got married. Even if she sends a photo of me and Abby as proof of infidelity, David will likely recognize her as just a friend. As I endured my mother-in-law's ridiculous and childish schemes, I suddenly had to go on a business trip overseas. It was a shame that I wouldn't be able to meet David because it was in a different country, but it couldn't be helped. I informed my mother-in-law who I live with about my business trip, although I didn't ask for her input. In her mind, it seemed to translate into a romantic getaway. While I was preparing for my business trip, my mother-in-law smirked and said, It'll be a big problem if you come back pregnant from your romantic getaway. David hasn't seen you in a while, so it won't be easy to pretend that the baby is his. Her distasteful imagination made it pointless to argue back. I responded nonchalantly. Yes, indeed. But it's a business trip, not a romantic getaway. And I left for my trip. My business trip was busy and hectic, and the days flew by in a whirl. When I finally returned to the U.S., I was exhausted. My boss, who had also joined the trip, seemed worn out as well and left for home. I had planned to buy some duty-free sweets before going home, so I took a break on a bench. At that moment, my phone rang. It was a call from Abby, and she told me something surprising. Uh, Emma, welcome back. There's something I need to tell you. Your mom came to the company our family runs. What? The company run by Abby's family isn't the type that ordinary people visit. When I learned that my mother-in-law had gone there, I felt my blood boiling. Abby told me how she handled my mother-in-law and asked me if she went overboard. I replied, no, I think it was just right. After laughing and ending the call with Abby... It was just about time to leave when I got another call from my mother-in-law. Emma, you should be back from your trip now. Did you enjoy your affair trip? It wasn't an affair trip. And I didn't particularly enjoy it because I went there for work. Well, I've already sent David the evidence photos. I simply responded with, I see, to my mother-in-law, who seemed pleased with herself. Ignoring my indifference, she just kept on talking. Actually, I moved, so your house is no longer there. I sold the old house, so you must be struggling without a place to go back to, but hang in there. I gave an uninterested, huh, to my mother-in-law, who happily laughed as she said this. Enjoy your life in your new house. <laughs> Thank you, and please never come back to our house. After all, you're going to be divorced soon. I stood in the airport for a while after my mother-in-law hung up. What gradually filled my heart was not anger, but joy. I did it! I made a little fist pump and started my journey home with a light step. Of course, I was returning to the house my mother-in-law said she had sold. The furniture was probably taken out by my mother-in-law. Although a lot of things were gone, I accepted it as a severance fee. I immediately called the locksmith to replace the front door lock so that my mother-in-law could not get in even if she returned. Then, I lay down in the living room, comfortably, 
celebrating the freedom I had finally attained. I made another fist pump inside the house, shouting, I did it! The next day, I got a call from my mother-in-law. What's wrong? I asked her maliciously as she spoke in a flustered manner. She was trembling as she said, Actually, I thought I sold the house, but it turns out I didn't. It seems I borrowed money without realizing it. Debt collectors are coming and it's really scary. That must be terrifying, because the company she unknowingly visited, thinking it was Abby's parents, was on the surface a real estate company. But its hidden side was a loan sharking business. According to Abby, they had told her repeatedly that the house couldn't be sold. The house was in David's name, so she couldn't just sell it on her own. Having been turned down by all the real estate agencies she went to, she ended up at the company Abby's parents ran. To her desperate plea to sell the house, they gave her a promissory note for a large amount of debt to sign. But she thought she was selling the house and signed it without reading the content. The document seemed to obligate her to repay $1,000 every day. She managed to pay off the debt collectors for today, but she doesn't have the means to prepare $1,000 every day from tomorrow on, so she came crying to me. Please, Emma, you have to help me. The debt collectors are pounding at my door from dawn. It's terrifying. I can't sleep well, and I don't have much money. I used the money I borrowed to buy a new house so I don't even have any savings left. I know what. Please, transfer $10,000 to my account every week until I've paid off the debt. Do you think there will ever come a day when you can pay off the company's debt? I don't think it will. Even if you combine my income with David's, it's impossible to transfer $10,000 every week. I'm sorry, but your only choice is to work hard and earn it yourself. What? As if there's a day job out there where I can earn $1,000 every day. Well, why don't you try talking to the company you borrowed money from? They might be able to introduce you to a good job. I meant it as a joke. But my confused mother-in-law said, Really? Then I'll go and see. And she hung up the phone. I thought to myself, oh dear. There was no stopping my mother-in-law now. I heard from Abby later that my mother-in-law suddenly showed up at the company and said, I have no choice but to work because I have no money. Is there a simple and easy job where I can earn more than $1,000 a day? Abby and her team did find my mother-in-law a job, a company where many people sleep in dilapidated shacks that serve as employee dormitories. In that company, they work tirelessly day and night, doing quite a bit of physical labor. Even elderly people are made to work relentlessly, so my mother-in-law seems to be working herself to the bone. The dormitory for the workplace is inside a network lined with barbed wire, reminiscent of a prison, and the employees are blindfolded and transported to and from work in a van, so they are forced to work without even knowing where they are. She'll be free once she can pay off the debt, that is if the day ever comes. Abby, who said this with a smile, is a dear friend of mine, but I hope she'll forgive me for feeling a little scared. Several weeks after my mother-in-law disappeared, David's overseas assignment ended and he returned home. When I told David what had happened, he only said, There's nothing we can do about my mom. All we can do is wish her a long life from afar. It seems David never really liked his incomprehensible mother from when he was a child. He tolerated her because she was his mother, but it seemed that David had completely lost patience with his mother, who continued to suspect me, his wife, of infidelity. When I asked David if he had received the so-called evidence photos of my infidelity, he said, Oh yeah, as if he had just remembered and handed me a photo from his bag. That's Abby, right? I have no idea why she would assume this was proof of infidelity. I actually had a huge fight with my mom over the phone. I told her I would cut ties if she kept suspecting you, Emma, but she just wouldn't listen, and it really annoyed me, but I thought this was a good picture, so I brought it home. True, my mother-in-law might have had a knack for photography. What a waste. The photo of Abby and me taken from behind by my mother-in-law, paired with the beautiful scenery, had a sense of style as if it were a page from a photo album, 
It was kind of funny how Abby was playfully making a peace sign behind her back. It was just so Abby. We owe Abby a lot. We should pay her a proper visit sometime soon. Just make sure you don't sign any documents she might try to get you to sign. I'll never sign any document that Abby gives me. Chuckling together, David and I were finally able to live like a newlywed couple. We had no idea what happened to my mother-in-law afterwards, but she's probably still doing hard labor somewhere in the States. We felt like we could find out where she was if we asked Abby, but neither David or I had any desire to track down my mother-in-law. David and I continued to live happily together, and I gave birth to our first child. We are enjoying our blissful days. I went to the wedding of a junior colleague from work, only for the bride to say, People with a low education and who are poor should sever ties with my husband. She was looking down on me because I dropped out of school. Rather than stopping her, my colleague, the groom, joined her in mocking me. I decided then and there to cut them out of my life and reach out to someone. Get ready, because I'm going to make you regret ever judging people solely on their education. My name is Godwin, and I'm 32. I was raised in an average family, neither rich nor poor, the only son of working parents. What sets me apart is that while most of my classmates were thinking about high school, I was frantically searching for a job. Both of my parents are college graduates, but I was eager to start working as soon as possible. At first, they were confused but eventually supported me, saying, it's my life to live as I see fit. I first worked as a factory laborer in my hometown, then switched jobs to become a painting contractor site supervisor. Now, I've been employed at a publicly traded major machinery manufacturer for seven years. I'm a service department manager visiting clients to handle machinery installation, repairs, and maintenance. Today, I have another round of repairs and maintenance visits planned. As I drive toward the freeway in the company car, my work cell phone rings. Seeing the displayed company name, my mood sinks a little. Not again. I pull over and call back immediately, only to find out it's another complaint from a client. I apologize. I'll be there right away, okay? I bow my head, apologetically, phone in hand, even though the person on the other end can't see me. Now, I have to rearrange my schedule to handle this complaint first. It's going to be a long day. After 7 p.m., I return to the branch office and find Theodore from my service department already back, chatting happily with a colleague from sales. I'm back. Good job. Noticing me, Theodore quickly heads back to his seat and starts working on his computer. Each branch office in various regions is staffed by a small team and overseen by an area manager. In this branch, it's just Theodore, who is two years younger than me, and myself in the service department. Hey, Theodore, got a minute? What is it? You could hear the irritation in his voice. Got a complaint from one of your clients this morning. I went and fixed it myself, but we're both going tomorrow to apologize. Why did you leave it unattended for two days? I had plans both days. The CEO over there is always bossing me around. Maybe they should rethink how they treat me. As usual, all that comes out of Theodore's mouth are excuses and complaints about the client. I'm reporting this to the area manager. I had to step in and fix a client's issue, of course. I have to report it. Yet, Theodore, without any remorse, snorts and says, So you're ratting on me again just because you're jealous of my education. You exaggerated things in your reports. He thinks I, a college dropout, I'm jealous of him. I graduate from a prestigious university. Theodore used to be this polite, humble, and adorable junior. But the moment he found out I was a dropout, his attitude changed entirely. I wouldn't mind if he did his job correctly, but there are too many complaints from his clients and it's a headache. 
The next day, we both go to the client to apologize. What are you doing here now? Your job is to fix this. The president of the client company is aggressive with his words, but it's not uncommon for people in industrial settings. I'm used to it, but Theodore, with no field experience, stands there saying nothing. After calming the angry client and discussing future improvements, Theodore finally mutters a soft, I'm sorry. I thought he'd be feeling down on the ride back, but I was wrong. Why are field workers so uncivilized? Instead of showing any remorse, Theodore was back to bashing the client. That CEO pretty much advertises his lack of education with the way he talks. It was embarrassing to witness. Who made the client that angry? Maybe you should reflect on your work. My words fall on deaf ears. You're just out of touch because you've worked in those environments. Even so, if you're going to be in this line of work, you have to get used to it. Theodore laughs mockingly. What are you talking about? I only took this job to gain some mechanical knowledge. I don't plan on sticking around. Typically, people like Theodore would spend two years in service, then move to sales, but he's been here for three years. Nobody's going to move a guy with so many complaints to a sales position. He genuinely believes the bad reports are all because of me being jealous. If that's the case, all the more reason to get good at your service job. Show some sincerity to the client. Sincerity? When his attitude is that bad? There's no sincerity to talk about. Maybe it wouldn't bother me if he was on the same level as me, professionally speaking. I couldn't bring myself to say another word to Theodore. One day, I was on a business trip to set up some machinery. The test run didn't go as planned due to some glitches, so I had to stay overnight to fix it the next day. We had limited staff at the branch, so when major tasks like this came up, other local branches would help out. As I was looking for a place to eat near the hotel, someone called out to me. Hey, what are you up to? Turning around, there stood Theodore, arm in arm with a woman. Oh, hey, Theodore. Good evening. I greeted the woman beside him and offered a handshake, which she accepted without a word. This is my girlfriend, Selena. She's from around here. I felt like I had seen her somewhere before, but I didn't dwell on it. Theodore invited me to dinner and I accepted. After ordering, Theodore started to gloat. Actually, we just got engaged. She graduated from the same college as me, and her family is quite wealthy locally. Definitely on a fast track to success. That explained the dinner invitation. He wanted to show off his fiancée. As for Selena, she barely acknowledged me, not making eye contact and offering only occasional nods to Theodore. Dinner ended with Theodore dominating the conversation. When it was time to go, he excused himself to go to the restroom. Left alone with Selena, she broke the silence. I've heard quite a bit about you from Theodore. Her eyes locked onto mine as she spoke with a certain coldness. I could tell Theodore had been bad-mouthing me. You think your managerial role is a big deal? Just because you've been at the company a few years longer? Could you please stop blocking Theodore's career? Certainly, the position of manager is something anyone can achieve through years of service and performance evaluations. And our direct boss is the area manager. For Theodore, I'm just a senior colleague, which isn't incorrect. Deciding it was futile to argue, I let it go. Theodore soon returned and wouldn't make eye contact, pretending like nothing happened. As I was leaving, I asked him about work for tomorrow, and he said he'd be helping out at this branch. Something felt off, but I didn't say anything because she was there. The next day, I went to troubleshoot a test run as planned, but Theodore never showed up. I felt uneasy, so I discreetly consulted the area manager and had him look into Theodore's business trip application. Turns out, on the day I met Theodore and his girlfriend, they were supposed to be on a business trip that involved an overnight stay. This was a clear false claim. The area manager asked to handle the rest so I left it to them. Sometime later, the date for Theodore and his girlfriend's wedding was set. 
I wasn't invited and felt relieved. But a week before the ceremony, the area manager asked me to attend in their place. They were supposed to give the main speech but couldn't make it, so they asked me to do it. I initially declined, but accepted when they said they had showed up later. On the wedding day, I arrived early and bumped into Theodore and his girlfriend on my way to the waiting room. They looked surprised to see me. You know, my elite friends and I all have degrees from prestigious universities and work in top-tier companies. I didn't think you. A dropout would fit in. So we didn't invite you. Theodore scoffed. I was asked to speak on behalf of the area manager who will be late. Once they arrive, I leave, I replied. The color drained from their faces. Are you trying to embarrass me by having a dropout give a speech? If the area manager can make it, there's no need for a speech. Leave now, Theodore commanded. Cut ties with my husband. You, an educated pauper, his girlfriend chimed in. They laughed haughtily and walked into the waiting room, leaving me stunned. A new emotion welled up and my whole body started trembling. If they want to sever ties, then so be it. I stayed under the radar and waited for my turn to speak. Finally, it was my turn. I took a deep breath and stepped up to the mic. Though Theodore and his girlfriend glared, urging me to leave, I started my speech unfazed. Congratulations on your wedding. If you thought I'd stick to usual pleasantries, you're mistaken. Theodore isn't exactly commendable in his job. But this is a celebratory occasion, so I must use only the highest praises. Top tier graduate, Theodore. You are exceptional in accumulating customer complaints at work. You're unrepentant and arrogant behavior. Always blaming our clients really showcases your thick skin i'm always impressed stop it now she stands up beside a flustered theodore and shouts overtaken by rage you're supposed to cut ties with theodore quit bullying him the room starts buzzing but i continue my speech and phase our Ivy League grad Theodore is quite the trickster he's been lying about business trips to go hang out with her and claiming expenses for it? <laughs> That's pretty bold. And clear embezzlement. Hey, cut it out! You're making this up! Theodore shouts red-faced and starts coming towards me. She also stands up and screams. What's your evidence for all of this? Are you insane? The room descends into chaos, prompting the MC to nervously ask me to stop. I thought... Maybe this is as far as it goes. At that moment, the door swings open with a bang. The ones who entered the now silent room were the area manager and the president of the client company. She goes pale when she sees the president heading straight for the bride and groom's table. So, you're lying about wanting to quit your job to marry me was a lie? Turns out, she had been working as a hostess at the club. I recognize her because I was once told at the club that she was the one I was supposed to marry. I had contacted the area manager to bring the president after realizing her true identity in her dressed up appearance. I lent you money to quit your job and pay off your debt. Then you disappeared and planned to marry someone else? That, 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 that is... She couldn't come up with any excuses when faced with the calm president. Even Theodore didn't know about her working in the hostess club. He storms back to her and confronts her. What is going on? She snaps back. You act all elite, but you are a no-good criminal. Even worse than a dropout. That dropout's just jealous of me. It's all lies. The area manager quietly stands in front of the shouting Theodore. We have evidence of your actions and we'll be reporting them to headquarters. You'll be suspended until a decision is made. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Theodore stands there, his face ashen. The president says to her, We'll be speaking through lawyers from now on. 
The once defiant woman breaks down in tears. The MC wisely suspends the ceremony and the guests are asked to leave. I leave the scene with the area manager and the president. Rumor has it that Theodore and she had planned to get their marriage certificate after the ceremony, but now it's off. Both families are blaming each other and fighting over the wedding costs. Theodore was fired for misconduct, and they're calculating the exact amount he embezzled for restitution. The only thing that stings a bit is that the area manager also received a pay cut for poor supervision of his subordinates. Theodore had timed his business trips to coincide with days when major tasks like machine installments were happening and the area manager had approved these trips. As for the woman facing fraud charges from the CEO for her sham marriage, she likely be tied up in court for a while. Of course, I've cut ties with Theodore and haven't spoken to him since that day. As for me, I'm just going to continue living my life with my head held high.